All right, guys, welcome to the uh, Property Investor Roundtable. I do this every week, every Wednesday, usually at one o'clock. I've just been trying out some live, uh, live stream software that TikTok supplied me and it did not work at all. So apologies for that if this has been a mess. Um, what I was trying to do is share slides and uh, didn't work at all. So um, I hope you guys can hear it a bit better now. Those of you who are joining in, I'd be delighted if you could just leave a note in the uh, chat there so I know whether or not you guys are hearing this properly. I'm going to get straight into sharing some slides with you guys. Um, you guys on the TikTok are not going to be able to see these slides. They were causing you to slow down and everything like that. If you want to go and see these slides, they're over in the uh, YouTube channel that I have. YouTube, um, my name and the YouTube channel is Gavin J. Gallagher on real estate. So if you go in there, you'll be able to kind of watch this live. Um, opening up my slides and let me just go straight to the uh, page where I left it before. And uh, yeah, here we go. All right. So this is a kind of a follow on of the podcast that I do every week. Whenever I do this podcast, it's always, um, I get a lot of feedback from people and they're asking questions about stuff. So this is kind of like a follow on from that. And uh, what I'm going to be doing in today's uh, talk is I'm going to be covering real estate news and then I'm going to be doing a little bit of thought leadership. Um, and I'm going to be talking about what kind of a property investor do you want to be? And then I'm going to get into some Q&A at the end. So if you guys have any questions, be sure to go and drop your questions into the uh, chat. Now, as I am just doing this, let me go and open up my slides. Um, trying to just get this into the right format. Yeah, that's better. And I'm going to swap over the slide setting and then drop that down. Yeah. Okay, now we're in good shape. All right, so the Q&A anyway, if you guys have any questions and about property investing, real estate investing, be sure to go and drop it in there and I'll be happy to answer those questions. So getting into real estate news, and in particular, we're going to just start off with the typical Financial Times property sector. And this is just covering UK house prices falling in, the, in October as borrowing costs have risen. Now, this has been something that a lot of people have been... Um, suddenly kind of shocked to find is happening. And that is that the because of the of the kind of screw up that happened with um, Liz Truss coming into government, announcing this kind of mini budget and saying that they were going to give all this money away, they were going to like uh, reduce the rates that the highest taxpayers paid and all this kind of stuff. There was a huge amount of stuff going on. And the problem is they didn't think it through. They didn't have it properly funded. They didn't know how any of this was going to work. It was all going to be Someday in the future, we'll figure out how to kind of manage this. Uh, hey, how are you? And so what's happened anyway is just to kind of tell you what's, explain what's happened is they went and they announced this budget. The budget was, the reaction from the markets was absolutely catastrophic. Everybody just basically suddenly looked at the, upon the UK uh, financial system as being like something from a, um, from a developing world country. And so something like that you would see in South, South America or, or, or Africa or something like that. And whereas before the UK economy was like one of the fourth or fifth most powerful in the world, all of a sudden it was seen as this kind of complete disaster. With that happening, the cost of the pound rose and all of a sudden the borrowing costs have shot up. And what it's done is, is it's caused lots of investors that piled into the market after the pandemic kind of eased off and suddenly property prices went like a freight train flying along. And what's happened is all of a sudden we're into a situation where they are unable to um, sort of see into the future as to what is the borrowing rate going to be. We are, what am I thinking of the torrential rain? Well, it's, uh, it's not quite on point with the topic that I'm talking about today, but it has been pretty bad. Um, anyway, West End property prices are falling as well. So look, just across the property market in the UK, this has been a total disaster and an awful lot of people would have borrowed money to buy property in the uh, just after the pandemic. Prices shot up. I know somebody who was put their pro property on the market and they got an extra something like 150,000 that they didn't expect. And uh, they were shocked by the performance of the market. The people who went and did that 
did it because interest rates were at such a low amount for so long. And so we're into a situation now that suddenly those interest rates are starting to creep up and people are now going, "Uh oh, we're in big trouble. So this is why it's something that we kind of, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of property people started to kind of get a bit nervous about what the future holds. UK house builders warning of new rules and taxes are going to add a load. I mean, it's the same going on in the Irish market at the moment. You've got this talk about the uh, the, the cement levy or the mica. Uh, there's this problem in um, in Ireland with uh, concrete that was produced in the uh, in the last kind of um, boom, and a lot of houses, like 150,000 houses, 160,000 houses, were built with a product that was inferior, and it uh, has started kind of collapse and. Um, so there's an awful lot of people that have got houses that are no longer structurally stable, and there's a huge amount of money that has to go into sorting all that out. You're from Donegal, Evie. Well, then you're aware of what the situation is, because I know it's quite bad over there. Anyway, the bottom line is the, uh, the government have suggested that the construction industry should have this 10% levy added on to the cost of every single housing project or every single construction project. Um, to fund this MICA thing. And the problem is that the construction industry is already going through a really difficult time um, with construction cost inflation shooting up. And because it's shot up so quickly, it's, um, it's pushed a lot of developments off the, uh, off the ability to be funded and go timber frame. Absolutely. Now, the only problem with timber frame, as I've discovered recently, is we were doing the development and the timber frame was coming from factories in the, on the continent and abroad and stuff, and we couldn't get the stuff in soon enough. And so we were badly delayed by that. And so this is it. So like everything has some sort of an aspect that can be problematic. Anyway, London Prime property also feeling the real from the mini budget. And so generally speaking, the UK market is in quite a lot of difficulty at the moment. Ireland is not suffering the same amount, but there is definitely a knock on impact. And so we all have to, um, we have to be a little bit careful about what's happening in the Irish market. Now, one of the things that I've been predicting on the podcast for the last, I don't know how many weeks at this stage, probably six weeks, I came out with a podcast a few one, uh, episodes back and I said that I thought the housing crisis is about to get worse, a lot worse. And um, sure enough, on Thursday's paper last week, good body stockbrokers came out and said that they are um, predicting a housing supply to fall further behind demand. Now, that means naturally that this is going to make it uh, even worse. Um, so, blah, de blah is saying, I think the prefabricated house, factory house is the future. I agree with you, definitely. Um, prefabricated in factories. In fact, I know somebody who, who's, in, who's in that whole sort of sector started Century Homes here in Ireland, and then and now they're in the US and they've created a, a very similar project in the US or a company that does all that kind of stuff in the US. So housing supply, anyway, it is in the process of getting worse. Um, we've, we're in a housing crisis. Nobody has ever witnessed or experienced a housing crisis like we are currently going through. And that is why rents are going up. That is why house prices have been going up. But we are in a situation now where when, you're, when you have such acute demand, um, naturally what's going to happen is supply grows in order to meet that demand. And so you put as much... Uh, cost and investment and resources into creating additional supply. The problem is, is that because of the 2008 crash, the global financial crash, most of the Irish market was completely decimated by that. And uh, it, it lost, you know, I, for every two construction jobs, one of those jobs was lost. And so basically 50% of the construction industry lost their job. And so total destroyed the market and because of that a lot of people had to move abroad they went over to canada australia different parts of the world and naturally when you go and move to a place for a couple of years you start to lay down roots uh, you might maybe you meet somebody you have children whatever it might be and suddenly you're not coming back to this market because of that we are now in a situation where we cannot even though we have such acute demand we cannot increase supply to meet that demand so it has really gotten into a very, very problematic uh, area. And um, I just don't think that um, even like if you were to snap your fingers in the morning and be able to 
double or triple or even quadruple the amount of houses supplied in the market. Um, if the funding exists to do that, you still couldn't physically do it because there's not enough contractors, there's not enough labor in the market. And we've got a situation where I, I have a friend who actually supplies housing um, for laborers that are being brought into the Irish market to kind of aid with the construction sector. And she can cannot get enough houses to actually put people into. And now on top of that, we've got the Ukrainian housing uh, or the Ukrainian refugee crisis. And everybody is, uh, you know, if you have vacant accommodation, the easiest solution is to go straight to um, go straight to it. Now, I see your comment there about the government likes REITs is not helping. you got to be careful about that because at this moment in time, REITs are actually what is funding the market. Um, like when you're talking about, if you're talking about traditional housing, yes, but REITs tend to go for big apartment developments and the big apartment developments would not be funded unless there was a REIT behind it. You have got to, um, like the big developments, like we, we'll be talking about um, Karen Holmes building on RTE, they're doing 600 units or something like that. I mean, there's no way that that would be built if REITs did not exist in the market. And um, the number of, yeah, exactly. The number of REITs is reducing. And that is because they are now finding better investment opportunities in the stock market and bond market. And the housing market looked like a fantastic thing back when interest rates were you know, negative and people were sort of saying, you know, what can we, where can we get the best return? And you looked at the Irish housing market and you could buy something at three and a half or 4%. That was far better than a negative rate return. But suddenly it's now we're into a situation where the ECB has been increasing rates. So suddenly a German bond is like 2% or something like that. And when you're comparing 2% against 3% for a big apartment block in Ireland, you kind of think, ah, I think I'll take the German bond because I can offload that with one push of a button. I don't need to manage 200 apartments. I don't need to reinvest. I don't need to do all this kind of stuff. So it is definitely impacting it. And you've got the housing supply. What's happening is the apartment buildings are probably the biggest way to build, um, uh, to supply the market quickly and get people places to stay. But those developments, they, they cannot be, if you were to build 100 apartments in the morning and to sell them on the market, you would lose money. There's absolutely no question about it. It's been proven that the cost of delivering apartment buildings is greater than the value than they are when they're put on the market, with the exception maybe if you're kind of selling in the middle of Dublin 4 or something like that, you know, the highest value area. But the traditional areas where people would be building apartments, they don't make any money at all. The only place they, they make money, uh, the only housing units that make money are residential uh, houses, like semi-detached houses and stuff. They're easy to build. Apartments, there's much, much greater rules and regulations around them. And so it's not making any money. And so the way it was working is the big REITs were coming along and they were pre-funding a development. They were, they were entering into a forward purchase agreement. And that forward purchase agreement would mean that the development uh, there's no risk to the developer. The developer just has to de develop the property and hand it over to the REIT. The problem is now that those REITs are starting to increase um, in value. Uh, or sorry, the construction costs, because they're shooting up with inflation and all that, the developers are now facing this risk where they've agreed to sell a big apartment building at, say, 50 million or whatever the, the sale price might be agreed. They might be trying to deliver the project for 35 million. So there's a there's a 15 million sort of there to cover the cost of the site and there's the and the profit is mixed in there somewhere. But all of a sudden you're into a situation where construction prices have increased by 20%. And in addition to that, funding costs have now increased by a similar amount. So you're into a situation where the profit on that project has been squeezed really, really down. And some cases it's uh, my eyes are super blue. Mm, that's great. <laughs> I think that's something to do with TikTok, not to do with my real eyes. Anyway, let's get on to the next thing here. Hammerson submits further plans for O'Connell Street. I was talking about this uh, a few minutes ago on a previous feed that I tried to, to do. O'Connell Street is a, a huge, big um, street, obviously, in Dublin with the GPO. It's a very historic street. Um, and, you know, if you think about Paris, you think about the Champs-Élysées being a beautiful sort of street and uh, all talk, no building. Yeah. 
the um the the guys in uh, the guys in that own the Dundrum Town Centre they've submitted a major development uh, proposal for O'Connell Street that would develop a pro uh, project over five and a half acres of land so it's um it's quite a, uh, a promising development and what they're trying to do is turn O'Connell Street into a really uh i suppose something that it should look like if you go to the champs elysees if you go to paris champs elysees walk down that street it has this grandiose kind of feel to it whereas if you walk down O'Connell street there's a lot of sort of like pound shops and all of these kind of really um problematic kind of things we have a question in on the b or 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 method what do i think about i'll be going into questions shortly i'll get through these slides that i'm that i'm reading from and then i'll go and jump into the q a We've also got Cairn Homes have lodged plans for uh, 688 apartments in um, in the RTE. So the land behind RTE is, is about to be developed by Cairn Homes. So that's a major project. They paid 107 million for the site. And that is a, it was an 8.6 acre site way back in 2018. Hard to believe they're only coming to the market with it now. But it just shows you the time it takes for a project to be brought to, um, to completion. Further ECB rate rises flagged as thousands pay more on mortgages. So the in the last couple of days, uh, the ECB has increased rates by another 0.75%. And this is going to continue going up, I think. I don't think it's anywhere near coming to an end. And so already we're talking about people having to pay close to 300 a month extra. And you can imagine what that's going to do to the market. It's going to mean that the amount of people on the market that would be you know, paying a rate and it would be kind of, you build your life around your mortgage payment and how much you have available to kind of spend on um, additional sort of expenses on, on your, on your you know, holidays or whatever it might be. That is all impacted by the amount of left, left over after your mortgage payments. So suddenly you're gonna see, I think the economy will suffer a bit of a fallback because of that. City plan, uh, they're planning a, a 12 buildings of up to 15 stories in Dublin 8. That's going to be interesting um, to see whether that actually gets built now in light of what I've been saying about the, the market kind of changing. One of the things that is interesting to see is there's a Dublin office complex uh, and what they were doing, uh, it was an office building in uh, Park West and they've actually now converted it into a, a housing scheme basically for 200 people. And uh, that's because the office, you know, offices are no longer really considered um, necessary by a lot of organizations. And so it's becoming uh, the go-to thing is to convert them into residential. Dublin City defies planning regulators. So this is an interesting one, just that the, the build to rent rules that Dublin City uh, is actually squabbling with the planning regulator. So you would think that those two things are the same, but actually what they are now is they're at odds with each other. And so it's interesting to see that the actual government, two government departments, essentially, neither of them can agree on something. And so they're actually entering into a squabbling match publicly. And um, do I think that property prices will drop significantly next year? I think there's a risk that they will. And the only thing is, is when you're talking about the Irish market, it's very, very hard to say, because the problem is, is that demand and supply are so out of whack. Like normally when, you know, if supply is, uh, you know, increases massively, then demand falls. But in this market, we just have so much demand that we cannot satisfy it with supply at all, anywhere, even closely. Now, what will cause it to fall, prices to fall potentially, are affordability. Um, you cannot buy a house, um, you know, unless you're able to afford the payments. And whatever the payments were 12 months ago, they are much, much higher now. And that is because rates have increased, interest rates have gone up. And in addition to your interest rate going up on your mortgage, what you're looking at now is you've got an additional uh, payments on your, you know, to fill your car, payments to uh, heat your home, uh, the electricity costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, gas prices have obviously shot up as well. And then in addition to that, what have you got? You've got the cost of grocery shopping and everything. Just inflation in general has shot up. And so it's um, it's a it's a problem, you know. I'm studying civil engineering. I'd love to visit your site in Shank Hill and ask you a few questions. Well, look, send me a DM on that and uh, I'll get back to you. 
what do I think about quantity surveying? I think quantity surveying is a, uh, it's an absolutely essential part of the industry. And we use quantity surveyor pretty much every day of the week. And, um, and so it's absolutely essential. So I think you're definitely, if you're studying it, then you're off to a good start um, because there's no way we're, we're going to stop needing that. And it's becoming more and more important. Excuse me. So anyway, let's get on. Now, the Doyle Group, this is just what's interesting is the only reason I'm kind of talking about this is they, they were the guys that started the, uh, the, the Jury's Hotel, which is kind of famous in Ireland. And Doyle's, um, they had basically uh, gone through the last couple of years, it would have been a tough couple of years with the pandemic and stuff. And all of a sudden it's bouncing back and they've returned to strong um, post-COVID return to, in the leisure market. So it's just interesting to see that things are bouncing back nicely. Um, there's a court case going on at the moment with a couple taking their bank to court over them being given an, uh, an unsuitable mortgage. Now, it's hard to believe, but we're talking about a mortgage that was issued to them in 2007. And uh, here we are 15 years later, and people are still in the process of trying to deal with these problems. So it just shows you to all of you guys that are, we'll say, budding property investors or people who are already investing in property, you need to think carefully about when you're going to go and borrow money. Because a lot of people, they kind of think, oh yeah, I got to jump into the property market and I'm going to go and buy my first property and stuff. But if you get it wrong, this can have a really, really long uh, tail and it can take years to get yourself out of a deal. Now, in my, in my sort of coaching program that I have, I have a mastermind and coaching program. In that, I've gone through some of the deals that I've done that have worked really, really well. And I've gone through the ones that have just been complete fails. And, um, and like in the ones that are fails, I think it took like 12 years to extract ourselves out of the, uh, the project, you know? Do I think there'll be a recession next year? Yeah, I do. That, I, I mean, I'm just going to call what I personally think. Obviously, it's a crystal ball, but um, I do think, would a single teacher in Ireland ever be able to afford a house? That's a difficult one to say. Like, I mean, uh, like, depending if you're in Dublin, you're probably going to struggle. But if you're outside of Dublin, if you're looking kind of um, further afield, then it may be possible. And if you're looking at funding it entirely out of your salary, well, that's a different story. But obviously, people rely on friends and family to kind of assist them, maybe making the first getting on the ladder or whatever. But I do think that prices are likely to fall back. Um, if there's a recession, prices could fall back. And so, it could be an opportunity to get in. But then one of the biggest problems with this market is that as the property prices fall back, the cost of funding them is going up because of the fact that interest rates are increasing. So it's a difficult one. Um, plans to convert Dublin offices into a hotel. So there is a, uh, there's a developer that um, they bought a, a site in Stevens Green and they wanted to turn it into a office building. And they turned it into an office building, they converted and everything like that, and it did not work. And so this has happened, I've seen this happen quite a bit, um, where people are trying to get into office, develop, into becoming office owners, and suddenly there's nobody interested. The office market has changed a lot. And uh, the pandemic has obviously affected it with people working from home and all that. And so we're into a really, really difficult situation now for anyone who has got an office portfolio you're starting to think about mm, what's the alternative use. And so in this case, these guys have converted it into a hotel after they spent a couple of years trying to rent it out as an office building. 10% drop, maybe. Who, who can tell? Like, if you go back to 2008, we looked at something like a 70% fall. And that was, it was entirely different purpose or there was the, the kind of the, the reason behind the fall in property prices back in 2008 was very different to what we're going through now. But um, yeah, I would say 10%, I'd say all day long, 10%, I'd say it could be more. But then again, supply demand imbalances will probably keep the market more buoyant than it would naturally be. Um, I just quickly going through some of these final slides before I get on to the, there's, oh yeah, this is interesting now, just we were talking about the, the property market. And here's an example now. There's a Dublin poor residential portfolio on the market at the moment. And they're looking for, they've got eight townhouses and 35 apartments off the Stilorgan Road. 
and they are putting them up for sale at 24 million purchase price, uh, which represents a yield of 4.83%. Now, you can go into the uh, stock market, you can go into crypto, you can go into anything like that, but you put your 24 into this, you'll get a 4.3% return on your investment. That's not very high. Um, but then uh, some of the slides that I've got further down, Galway City Residential Investment. Okay, so it's not as big as that other one, but it's they're offering 8.5 million and it's offering a 5.6% yield. So would you prefer to own houses and apartments in Dublin at 4.8% yield, or would you prefer Galway at 5.6%? It's a small difference, but the locations are very, very different. And uh, it'd be interesting. Now, the, the, the price that you're paying is substantially more for Dublin. You're talking around 24 million. So it's three times the price, but the yield is pretty close. And personally, I think I would be going for the Dublin before I would go for the Galway. Uh, Western Hotel, they're looking to get in and Nike, Nike are going to be going into Blanchardstown. So anyway, look, that is our property news. And I'm going to quickly now go to some thought leadership. Um, I talk about my what kind of investor are you? Okay, so when you're, gonna, when you're thinking about getting into property investment, you've got to be asking yourself, like, where do you want to be? If you want to get into property investing, what is your vision for the future? Do you see yourself as just dabbling or do you see yourself as actually being like a fully fledged entrepreneur in the real estate industry and that that's all you do, yet you're involved fully up to, you know, sleeves up, that's what you do. If you have children, will you gift them their deposit on their houses? Yeah, I think that would be, um, what do I think about auctioneering? Auctioneering is probably a good way to get into the market because when you, um, like it depends where you go. If you're in the country and you're looking at auctioneering, then you're really going to just be selling houses in the area and stuff. If you come to Dublin and you get into, um, you know, real estate, uh, if you get into like one of the big agencies, then what they can do is they can pigeonhole you into a little sort of area uh, and you'll specialize, um, but you won't know about the whole sort of side of the market. And so there's two ways to look at it. And um, one of the reasons why I, I sort of ta started talking about, you know, the what kind of investor do you want to be is that that is a path to becoming one of these investors is that, you know, you've got to think about you today versus you in the future. Like, what are you studying at the moment if you are sort of in college? Or what is your degree? Or where are you? What is your experience? Do you, can you, are you handy? Like, can you get in and roll up your sleeves? Do you work in the construction industry? Are you a tradesman? All of this kind of stuff helps with just having some sort of a vision for your future career. Is the path ahead obvious? Um, if you're in auctioneering, well, then there is actually kind of a route into the property industry because you're going to be watch you're going to be dealing with people who are investors buying property selling property all that kind of stuff so you're in the market whereas if you are a person who's not in the like say you're working in a shop or something like that how do you get into the property industry it's definitely more difficult routes to gain access to the ladder yeah that is something that we're talking about here so you got to choose a strategy to get in. And somebody asked the question earlier, what do I think B or or method? That is definitely a method to get in. B, to those of you who don't know, B or 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 method, that is buy property, you refurbish the property. Then when it's refurbished, you rent it out. And then when it's collecting a stable income, then you go to the bank uh, that, you, that you used to buy it initially, you get the property refinanced because you bought it in a bad condition. You refurbished it so it's now in a good condition. And what you might have done, let's just use the example of one of my clients in from the, my mastermind. They bought a property recently in, I think, Sligo or Mayo, and they paid 130000 to buy this property. They have refurbished it, and they've expanded it. They've added an extra room or an extra bedroom or whatever, and they're renting it out now. And they got it valued, and the valuer came back and gave them, I think, 183000 value. Now, they spent... I think no more than about 10 or 15 grand doing up the house, but it's increased in value by about 40,000 or a little bit over that. And so they've made a 25,000 profit. Hello from Slovakia. Good to, good to hear from you, Slovakia. Um, or throw all your money on crypto and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one. 
So anyway, the bottom line is B or, 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 or that's a lot way a lot of people get in. They go and buy the property. They buy it like in a, in a poor rundown kind of a state. They do it up. And what a lot of the people will do is instead of renting it out as a house, they rent it out on a bed by bed basis or a bedroom by bedroom basis. So if you have a four bedroom house, rent out each of those four rooms to individuals and you'll get an awful lot more rent than you would if you rented the house to a family, we'll say. So there's a couple of different ways that you can get into the property. You can start with no property at all. And obviously you just have to kind of try and figure it out. It, a lot of people will have their own home. So that's obviously a starting point. If I had a million and I was thinking of starting, where would I, what would I do? I would go down the road of the, the B or, or, or I would be looking for properties that are in poor condition that are not in a, um, that are, I'm not actually doing any, I'm not bringing people on. Um, what you have is, so let's say I go out and I find a house that has a good side garden. If it has a side garden, even better. But let's say you find a three bedroom house and what you can do is extend the house out the rear and add in an extra couple of bedrooms and then go and rent that house out on a per bedroom basis. So try and put an ensuite into each room, maybe put a little fridge freezer kind of, or a little one of those mini fridges and a microwave into the room and that's it. And you go, and I have a friend uh, going, doing that at the moment and he's doing very, very well on it. And he's, you know, he, he, the, the rental for a standard property might be 2,500 a month. He's getting about 5,000 a month by doing this. So he's obviously getting an awful lot more cash than would typically be generated. There is the thing called the accidental landlord. The accidental landlord is typically what happens. Somebody comes along and they buy a property for their home. And then when they decide that they're, they, you know, they got married or they've moving to another area, whatever it is, instead of selling their home, they decide that let's put it on the rental market and, and become a, a landlord. And when they do that, they become an accidental landlord. It was never their long-term intention, but now they are a landlord. Now, you can be a professional property investor, somebody who's out there who's doing this day in, day out. You can be a property developer who's a person who obviously buys land and does up the land, like actually gets plans and builds houses and stuff. And then there is what is kind of the top of it all is like the real estate entrepreneur. And that's a person who is just completely engrossed in the property industry. They have multiple streams of income coming from all sorts of uh, different angles in the property industry, whether that's rent or that's you know development uh, management, whatever it might be. There's a lot of different ways, but there's guys out there that have got their hand in many different pies. They're a promoter, they're a manager, development manager, project manager. They're, they're, they've got, you know, rental property over one here. They've got developments over there. That's all the stuff that I've done over the, over the years. I've thrown tr my hand on a lot of different things. Some of them work, some of them are not so, uh, not so good. So what are your resources? The next thing you have to ask yourself, if you want to get into this business is how are you going to fund getting into this? Um, are you able to self-fund your development? A lot of people, um, if you own a house without a mortgage, is there any way to release equity on the property? Absolutely. You just, if you don't have a mortgage, then you can go and get a mortgage and uh, that will release equity from your property. Just make sure that when you do it, you leave uh, the, first of all, you should probably fix your rates so that you don't have to worry about the increase and the decrease and all that kind of stuff of your rates. But second of all, um, don't over leverage yourself. A lot of people go in and they say, oh, I want to get 80% out of the bank and I'll just keep 20% in the property. That's all fine. But if you suddenly find then that the market, that the interest rates have shot up, you're into a difficult situation. And it might find you might find that you wish you hadn't leveraged it so much. Maybe going 50-50 is a sen more sensible, prudent way to approach it. If you don't have your own self way to self-fund your development or your investment sort of decisions, then what some people will do is go to family and friends and they'll try to kind of create, yeah, leverage can be dangerous, but it's also essential as well at the same time. So it's kind of a, it's like a double-edged sword. Uh, when you're getting into, like, if you're going to get into the property industry, leverage is what makes it possible. Um, most people don't have 150,000 in cash lying around to buy their first property, but you'll, people can kind of scrabble together like 40,000 and then borrow the rest. And so, and then you create value off the back of that. Lenders is the next option. 
You can obviously go to banks, secondary lenders. The other way you can do it is to actually create a partnership. And it's either a partnership of equals or you can have a strategic partnership or you can have one where somebody's a silent partner and you're the person doing all the work. We call that a SWEC equi equity kind of relationship. And then there's going to the investors, that is to kind of raise money from investors and stuff. Cash, non-cash, you know, people can go out there. They might have other assets. You might have a short-term loan from your family, friends, can become partners, whatever. There's also the pension fund. Some people have used pensions as a method for actually um, uh, funding development. And that can be a good way to do it, actually, because if you can, you can own a property inside a pension, there's absolutely no tax in the whole thing. Do I have any recommended books for property investing? I'm actually writing one at the moment for myself uh, that is kind of linked to my uh, mastermind program and coaching. But um, there is, let me think. Um, I tell you what, go and have a look. If you haven't, if, if you're not listening to my podcast, that would be a good start. And uh, if you go and have a look at my website, GavinJGallagher.com, Gavin J gallagher.com that will um i'll be putting a book out fairly soon and i'll be able to kind of send that out to you lenders okay whenever you're thinking about lending there's a couple of different options open to you you've got the pillar banks those are the kind of the, the main street banks that everybody would be familiar with over the years then there's other lenders okay there's capital flow dillisk here in the irish market those are guys that are they're like the main banks but they're not main banks, but they do have similar kind of borrowing. Uh, they have credit committees. They have all, they're kind of like a bank, but they're not an official bank. You also have secondary lenders. Those are companies that are, they're in the business of lending, but they're kind of specialists and um, they're usually more expensive. And, um, but then again, if you go to them with some sort of development, they've probably seen it very, for, very regularly before. And so they'd be very quick to come back and, um, when they come back to you, you know, within a couple of days, whether you've got a, you're getting the loan or not, you won't be held kind of for months waiting for an answer like some of the bigger banks. Random question. Have I ever read a book, a diary of an economic hitman? No, never. And then professional investors. Uh, that is, you know, there's, a, there's actually investors out there that are actually basically lending money and um, they can be good option um, you know, but they usually want to have their cake and eat it. They usually look to have a percentage of the deal and they're looking for, you know, uh, what you call a coupon on their money. And so it can be complicated. You can go to smaller investors and that's like a simple loan. And I know lots of people that are doing that and they pay them, you know, seven, eight percent a year based on the, uh, the amount that they've borrowed. Now, partnership is a great way to do it. If you have a partnership, then, um, it's, you know, it's a way to kind of split the uh, division of trade, uh, you know, the, the division of, what's the word, division of trade or the division of activity. You have got one skill and your partner has another skill. So let's say, for example, you're a person who is very good at kind of numbers and working out legal stuff and all that. Your partner might be somebody who is good on construction. They may be working on the construction side or something. So bringing your skills and their skills together you've got complementary skills and you'll actually be able to build a small little portfolio. And um, you'll, you know, one person looks after the financial, uh, the legal side, the other person looks after the construction stuff. That's a great partnership to have. Silent um, partners. Now, those are the ones where somebody basically behind the scenes, they don't want to roll up their sleeves. They don't want to be involved in the day-to-day. -day. What they want is for you to just do all the work. Now, that is usually a good way to kind of get started because if you're a young person who is getting into this business for the first time, what a lot of people will do is they'll try and find somebody who's much older, much more experienced, but doesn't want to roll up the sleeves and do, they, but they're a good person to kind of be able to point you in the right direction. And they'll just say, look, here's 150 grand, go off and, uh, and invest it and do it wisely and come to me if you need to make any kind of big decisions. And you do all the work, and you get a carry. That is, you'll get like a percentage increase of, on the deal. Strategic partners work in a similar way, but what you might do is you might go to a, like an organization, like a stockbroker or an accounting firm or something, and you sort of say to them, look, you guys have got, you know, 100 clients that are uh, investors, that are, you know, you know, clients that basically get their work, uh, that get their tax 
done by this firm. And you sort of say, look, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm looking for an investor. And the firm might go and invite some of their clients to go and have a look at a presentation that you're doing or something. You got to ask yourself, what do you bring to a partnership? Okay. So whenever there's a partnership, what you're looking at really is there, there are three things in a partnership. Okay. There's brand, there's distribution, and there's product. And when you're talking about distribution, what you're talking about is somebody that can get your, like, we'll assume that you're the person who's putting a deal together and you're the person who needs an investor, okay? Um, or you need distribution. What that means is that you've got the product, you've created the little development um, opportunity or the little investment opportunity. And you go out, my foot, my watch, you go out there and you've created this little kind of product, this investment product pro opportunity. But you need to go and try and get in front of as many investors as possible. And how are you going to do that? Well, that's distribution. So you go to a bank or you go to some sort of a lending institution. You go to somebody that is interested in asking their clients or their members, would you like to invest in this person's uh, development or in this product that you're creating? And if you're able to do that, then you'll have to obviously share some of the, the benefits. You'll have to share the, uh, the resources that, uh, that is made on the deal with your partner. The other way is brand. And that would be, for an example, uh, Richard Branson has been trading on his Virgin brand for a long time. Like Virgin is obviously this big brand name. And what he'll do is he'll bring his brand and his distribution, but other people will bring the product. So you go to the likes of a Richard Branson with a, uh, an opportunity to go and get into Coca-Cola. We want to go and take on Coca-Cola you'll produce the Coca-Cola tin and you'll wrap Virgin on the side. And that's the brand. So that's the partnership. He has no hand or act in the actual creating of the product. You just simply are there to, um, to, to, to kind of go off the back of his work as a brand ambassador and whatever. And the final way to get into the market is to be uh, to, to, to partner up with, with investors. And there's a couple of different investor types. There's the amateur investor, okay? Those are really simple investment deals. You go to somebody and you just simply say, look, I just want, I've got a, I'm creating a little company. It's going to be doing this development of four houses or we're going to be buying this property here and it's got five units or whatever. And that's just simple. You put in your 20 grand, he puts in the 20 grand. It's a 50-50 partnership, 40 grand of equity. And then you go to the bank and you maybe borrow another 80,000 or whatever. And that will be, your, uh, your 120,000 investment. Very simple, no need for complications. If you're going to go for the bigger developments, obviously, then you start having to reach out to professional investors. And when you start reaching out to professional investors, the, the structures become far more complicated. You end up with, you know, you know legal agreements that are pretty, you know, heavy duty. And uh, I've, I've spent I think 100,000 on one particular deal to go and do the, the legal agreement. Like it was a big, huge, thick document, like 60 pages or something. And so a solicitor had to write, sit down and write that document. And that was time consuming. So you have to pay for that. Other one, you know, the amateur version of that is just a little two pager agreement. Here's what we're buying. Here's what the split of the profits is. And that's it. The other one is strategic um, investors. And by that is you're, if you're buying an air, in an area, and maybe there's somebody who owns the adjoining property or something like that, that would be a strategic investor, somebody who's coming in and the combination of your asset and his asset together, there's an additional value by marrying those two assets together. That would be either a strategic partnership or potentially a strategic investment. I am um, One of the things that I have created, uh, I have a, a mastermind and a um, uh, kind of a coaching program. And one of the things I teach in that is, how to pitch to investors and how to structure deals for investors. So if anyone's interested in that, that's actually um, kicking off next week. And uh, so if you're interested, be sure to send me a, a, a direct message or whatever in here. So questions, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm going to be finishing up in a few minutes. So be sure to drop your questions. We had the question about uh, auctioneering. I'll just go back to answering that. So auctioneers, when you're into uh, auctioneering, um, the other alternative, there, there's two types of course you can do. You've got auctioneering and you've got what's known as property economics. And with property economics, you can do that in 
some of the, the technical schools. It used to be DIT, Bolton Street, and that was the Dublin Institute of Technology. Now it's whatever it's called, the Dublin Technical University, which is based out of Grange, Gorman, or whatever. So the bottom line is uh, you do that course, you learn all about the economics and everything like that, and then you have a license to go out and you can become an estate agent or you can become an auctioneer. And when you've got that skill, then you're able to meet clients, sell them property, all that kind of stuff. Naturally, being in that side of the business, you will come in up in front of deals all the time. You'll be looking at property regularly. When you're looking at property regularly, you'll start to get a feel for the, um, the value of it. You'll start to get a feel for the more popular areas. So it is probably a good way, if you have an interest in getting into property, is to do that. Now, the only thing you have to watch is I've seen this before is people get into becoming an auctioneer or an estate agent or whatever, and they become so busy servicing their clients that they never actually invest themselves. And, uh, and one of the guys I brought on my podcast about, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago was a guy based in the U S and he was one of the biggest estate agents in the state that he was living in. And yet he had never, he only just decided to buy property a couple of years ago. And I was asking him like, what, what delay, like, why did he, He's like dealing in property every day of the week. Like, why didn't he go and start much, much sooner? And he said it was just a self-limiting belief. He didn't think he could do it. And so uh, it just shows you how it can. Is it a bad time to begin an auctioneer because of the property market? I think, you see, you got to be careful of short-term thinking like that. If you're thinking about becoming an auctioneer uh, or a property investor or whatever, you should be thinking on a career level you should be thinking that you'll be in this business for years to come okay if you're thinking that can i get a job out of college in two years time or three years time or whatever that's probably a a bad way to kind of look at it because your career can last a lifetime whereas you might not like you might come into the market just at the moment when things are difficult um but you will uh, you you don't want to necessarily abandon a career in this business just because it's currently a bad time. And what would you go into alternatively? Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of different things to kind of get into. At the moment, you know, you might decide that you're you can look at some sort of weird computer kind of chip design or something like that. Nobody's using that technology at all. So what's the point? But two years from now, suddenly it could be the biggest, hottest thing. So you never really know. And uh, and so I think you have to be careful about thinking short term like that. And the reality is you come out of the market next year, we'll say, or the year after. And if it is a difficult market, it's a good time to decide, you know what, I'm going to go traveling. I'm going to go and I'm going to you know, travel across Canada or Australia or whatever it might be and go and use your auctioneering job to go and work in these kind of places. Great time to be an auctioneer. Very few license holders, and it takes two years to complete. There, that's coming from the horse's mouth. So, a little bit of feedback from the from the from the chat. All right, guys, I'm pretty much finished today. I usually try to do this in one hour, from one to two. It was a bit delayed today because I was trying out this TikTok software that didn't really work. So, um, um, if you guys have any questions, I'm about to uh, shut this thing down. But I do this every Wednesday at one o'clock. So if you want to jump in the next time, um, be sure to do that. Check out my podcast if you aren't already. The podcast is called Behind the Facade. I do the podcast. Uh, I put out a video every Tuesday morning. And our, it's a video and a, an audio, obviously. And uh, thanks for the advice. Oh, yeah, you're most welcome, guys. Um, happy to do it. And um also, I have a YouTube channel, which you guys might want to check out. It's called Gavin Gallagher, Gavin J. Gallagher on real estate. And uh, I'm going to be putting this live stream in there. So if you want to go and look back at the start of this or whatever, that's where you'll find it. And uh, so hope you found this useful. I look forward to talking to you guys same time next week.